So before we get into talking about the built environment and architectural history, I want us to take a moment to think about the land that our architectural um, buildings are built on. And wherever you are calling in from, you are on indigenous land. And Mohai itself is on the land of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and Coast Salish peoples. People who were forcibly removed, but whose endurance we honor with deep respect and gratitude for their stewardship of this place. And to this day, the Duwamish people have yet to receive federal recognition. And we at Mohai encourage you to learn more about their struggle for federal recognition, as well as by visiting the Duwamish Longhouse, which is in West Seattle, to learn more. Thank you for taking time to think about that. And um, it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, is Paul Kidder. Paul Kidder is a professor of philosophy at Seattle University, where he's taught courses on ethics in urban affairs and philosophy of art and architecture. He's the author of Minoru Yamasaki and the Fragility of Architecture. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. Thank you, Rachel. And I am delighted to be here. I am a white male who is coming to you from my basement, I mean, my study and library in North Seattle. It's great to have so many people from all over the region and even the country here today. I wanna to say special thanks to MOHAI, which is an institution that has been important to me throughout my life and particularly as a child and as a parent. And Mohai took an early interest in my project on Yamasaki through their Rainy Day podcast uh, more than a year ago. Also, I wanna thank History Link. <clears throat> it's a delight to be here. Director Murray McCaffrey has been someone I have known for many years and also the late Walt Crowley. In fact, uh, Walt wrote the History Link entry on Yamasaki. And his piece was where my researches began years ago when I started the project. So I would like this uh, to be an occasion to honor the memory of Walt Crowley. My, uh, my study of uh, my scholarship on Yamasaki is part of a renewal of interest in his work that is reflected in the work of uh, John Gallagher and Dale Geyer in Detroit, and most re recently from New York, Justin Beale, the author of the book, Sand Future. Uh, we are taking in various ways, we're taking new interest and new angles on the work of this architect who has been neglected in many ways in uh, previous decades. I am a philosopher of architecture interested in the question as to how one interprets an architect's significance and the role of existential meaning in architecture. Yamasaki was an interesting case to explore in this connection because he aspired to a meaningful and historically resonant kind of architecture. I have found that people who use his buildings tend to like them. And it's great to have people here this evening who have had experiences with his buildings. They tend to like them and even rave about them. But his reputation has been shaped by architects and critics who have been exceptionally harsh on his work. And I wanted to know why is that? Why is there this disconnect between the public and the professionals? So my study involves asking theoretical questions about the values and assumptions that inform modern architecture and people's experience of it. But I also became in the process uh, an accidental historian because there was very little written on Yamasaki when I began so that I had to do a lot of digging in archives and seeking out of interviews with people who knew Yamasaki and his work. Uh, 
wanting to encounter the works firsthand, I visited and photographed some 50 buildings. Tonight, I want to share some of what I learned that made it into the book, uh, but also some items that did not make it into the book because they are of local interest. I have heard Yamasaki called Seattle architect, Minoru Yamasaki. And in one sense, that's correct. I mean, he was born here. Uh, he was educated at the University of Washington. He has three buildings in town. Uh, but uh, it's not exactly true. The three buildings are uh, the Federal Science Building that he did for the Seattle World's Fair in 62, now the Pacific Science Center, which is uh, famous for its, its uh, lovely white, delicate, thin uh, arches. The IBM building, now called 1205th, but which uh, features these uh, tall, a box-like building with tall pinstripes and Roman arches at the base. And the Rainier Tower with its, uh, a skyscraper with its daring tapered pedestal that the thing sits on. These are the three buildings you probably know. But Yamasaki was, strictly speaking, he was a Detroit architect. That's where he was based. And uh, he is known for uh, buildings at the uh, Wayne State University, including the McGregor Memorial Conference Center, which is an elegantly balanced building with modernized columns uh, covered in travertine marble with the formal balance of the building enlivened by chiseled patterns, both inside and out. Below this building is a sculpture garden of rocks and pools that makes for a place of meditation and respite. At Wayne State is also the Prentice and DeRoy buildings. DeRoy, uh, an auditorium with a simple box-like form that is ornamented with arches topped with shapes like flower buds. And also the education building, which uh, is, has concrete styled in Gothic forms and uh, includes uh, an arched colonnade surrounding the building. And as in many buildings, you see this uh, roof line tiara of these gentle pinnacles. In Detroit, there's also a famous skyscraper, a one wood, the first skyscraper Yamasaki decide, one Woodward is what it's now called. And it's, it's a, uh, uh, a simple white skyscraper with strong vertical lines to it. At one time, Yamasaki was a St. Louis based architect. He also had an office for a while in St. Louis. And a famous building there is uh, Lambert St. Louis International Airport. It was one of the first airports that was uh, really ambitious in trying to um, use thin shelled streamlined concrete domes to recall the grandeur of traditional train stations, but equally the graceful lines of air flight. Yamasaki designed many university buildings, including uh, the Olin Hall of Science at Carleton College. That's one of five buildings by Yamasaki at that school. This one with uh, a, a screen of uh, Romanesque arches and decorative concrete. Butler University in Indianapolis, uh, with a library fashioned inside and out with colonnades of stacked arches, its atrium uh, graced with an interior pool and fountain. Princeton, Robertson Hall, a Parthenon-like building, but with graceful sweeping columns that make the top story almost seem to float. Oberlin Conservatory of Music, 
uh, the conservatory's hexagonal windows uh, are a distinctive feature and are kind of have become a kind of symbol uh, image of the of the conservatory. It has it's a cluster of buildings around a Japanese garden and koi filled pond, and it features a an auditorium uh, famous for music from Oberlin, which has uh, these tall uh, windows from floor to ceiling that reach the roof and form curved shapes like lines of melody. So those are university buildings. There are also many office buildings, such as the North, uh, Northwestern National Life Insurance Company, which is now Voya Financial, a very prominent building in downtown Minneapolis, which is uh, uh, one of his most temple-like buildings with a grand porch of thin columns and Gothic arches, stone and stone panels in the windows uh, that have a decorative complexity like stained glass and a large reflecting pool that heightens the effect of this building. It's, a, it's a, like a temple, but you know, it's an insurance company. So uh, uh, this was a really remarkable thing he was trying to do. But he also designed actual temples such as the North Shore Congregation Israel Synagogue in Glencoe, Illinois. This building is perhaps his most biomorphic in its imagery, noted for recollections of Art Nouveau and associations to palm fronds and artichoke leaves in the design of its walls and windows. Yamasaki also did cultural buildings, such as the Japan Center in San Francisco, where he was called upon to reflect his Japanese heritage in modern uh, stylized uh, recollections of traditional Japanese form. So many kinds of buildings in many cities. Uh, he did do one building in New York, just one, but it was a doozy. The Twin Towers of the World Trade Center that soared with their quiet, minimalist simplicity above the Manhattan skyline. So in a sense, a Seattle architect, but fundamentally an American architect rooted in the Midwest, building buildings all over the country and indeed all over the world. But I want to say, that his connections to Seattle go deeper than many people realize. And this is something that came through in my research, particularly in the special collections at the University of Washington. So I'm gonna indicate five ways in which this is true. First, his formation as an architect at the University of Washington. Second, his involvement with the Century 21. Third, his role on the University of Washington Architectural Commission for several years. Fourth, the influence of his style, which is felt all over, but certainly too in the Northwest. And finally, his work on the Metropolitan Track buildings, the IBM building and the Rainier Tower. So I wanna speak first to how Seattle influenced him and that is primarily through his training at the University of Washington. I'm calling it a formation. And uh, I teach at a Jesuit school. So that word formation has a powerful resonance for me. It is not simply training, but it is the kind of shaping of imagination and values that go deep into the psyche of somebody and particularly a creative person. I think he was formed at the University of Washington in a permanent way. Education at that time in the program was based upon uh, the Beaux-Arts tradition. They did not follow exactly the uh, French Beaux-Arts curriculum, but they uh, drew on it heavily. And the basic orientation was to engage powerfully with historical architecture 
And that involved assignments, very imaginative assignments that would have students uh, render historical kinds of forms. And so to be an architect in those days, you had to be a watercolorist. That's a marvelous thing. Uh, and here's one of Yamasaki's early watercolors of a gateway to an artillery school, which he has rendered in heavy stone forms that are highly decorated and uh, decorated uh, uh, large doors. So uh, a really powerful structure. And then he's complemented it with uh, the figure of an equestrian with a tall red feather coming out of his hat. The uh, teacher who was enormously influential was at the, the program at the time was Lionel Pries. And there's a wonderful book on Pries by Jeffrey Oxner on the faculty at U University of Washington, where, uh, and, and the cover of his book shows you uh, uh, a marvelous watercolor painting of a home by and he was just a superb uh, master of rendering in watercolor. And this was part of what was terribly inspiring to students. One of Yamasaki's later projects in the program was a, a planetarium and aquarium, which he did in a style called Streamline Modern, which has a dome and staircases and uh, flanks on either side in a simple white form, but with uh, elaborate gargoyles included. If you look at that design from above, uh, the floor plan, you see in the center of it, a lecture hall and the planetarium is in there. And then surrounding it is uh, the aquarium. And on the floor of the aquarium, Yamasaki has designed delicate sea life figures that he has painted in there. So it's this kind of care in decorative detail that was part of the program, the engagement with historical forms, but doing so in a very creative way. And I think that had a, a powerful effect throughout his career. We could also speak of the Japanese American experience in the Seattle in the 1920s and 30s. He was influenced, of course, by Japanese culture, but also by the uh, discrimination, the oppression of Japanese Americans uh, in the Northwest at the time. It was a bad experience, uh, both in Seattle and especially working in canneries in Alaska that made him want to leave. And so he did, he left after college to New York City and there finding work in several firms, he became more of a modernist uh, than he, uh, he had experienced in the program at University of Washington. Uh, UW eventually got very much into the modern styles but hadn't by the time Yamasaki left. And uh, he then uh, encountered the radical modernists there, the Bauhaus school. Uh, and a particular favorite of his was Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, somebody who inspired him with his uh, talent for making innovative use of the new building materials of uh, concrete, steel, and glass. Uh, Mies sought a kind of geometrical rectilinear rectilinear purity in his architecture that was uh, captivating to Yamasaki and many other architects of the time. And so an artistic vision is formed. It includes the richness and delight of historical architecture and the grace and refinement that modern design uh, can bring and technology can bring to architecture. So he's trying to synthesize these two things. And I call it the synthesis of Mies and Pries, which is the phrase I like because it rhymes, of course. 
but the, the more common name, the name the critics assigned to it was the term new formalism. And that was uh, a term that was applied to Yamasaki and uh, also uh, 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 Edward Durrell Stone and Philip Johnson and a couple of other architects who were doing something similar. So let's uh, talk about Century 21, the 1962 World's Fair. Yamasaki was selected for the Design Standards Committee. A man named Harold Scheffelman came to visit him in Detroit and asked him if he would serve on this Design Standards Committee for the fair, which he accepted in 1957. Now, how did Scheffelman get the idea of asking Yamasaki? Well, I hunted in the, architect, uh, in the archives and I don't have a definitive answer, but my, my, my prime suspect is a man by the name of James Chiarelli, who had been a classmate of Yamasaki's. And a lot of those classmates kept in touch with each other. And so uh, I think he was the guy who suggested Yamasaki. And so Yamasaki having been gone for more than 20 years from Seattle, agreed to come back and be on this design standards committee. His contribution there was to make the case that the Seattle Center, the fairgrounds, should become a permanent amenity for Seattle. Uh, and including things like uh, turning the Civic Auditorium there into the city's opera house and uh, having permanent facilities for theater and also to make his science pavilion uh, a, a permanent building. Uh, so we can thank Yamasaki for the Pacific Science Center, but perhaps also for uh, making, helping to make Seattle Center uh, a permanent fixture uh, and a cultural center for the city. In the design of the Science Center, he drew on a couple of clear influences. One of the buildings that was deeply embedded in his imagination was the Doge's Palace in Venice. Uh, it is a building that is uh, strongly geometrical, in some ways a simple box, uh, but it has this way of being heavy at the top, you know, strong, assertive, and then this, these upper levels held aloft by colonnades uh, uh, that are uh, delicate, uh, enchanting, uh, decorative, and engaging. And then uh, on the roof line, there is a uh, ornate tiara. So a building with simplicity, complexity, heaviness, lightness, uh, and all of it held in a remarkable kind of balance. He used to he keep saying, there's something about that building. There's something about that building. He just pondered it over and over again. And another building that was like that for him, a very different kind of building, was the Edith Farnsworth House in Illinois uh, by Mies van der Rohe. And here is a building that it too is a kind of formal geometrical rectilinear kind of building, but everything in it is pared down to the simple steel beams, concrete slabs, and uh, windows, floor to ceiling windows. But in this use of modern materials to evoke a kind of classical formality, there's also a lot of uh, impish uh, sleight of hand going on. For example, if you take the steel beams that hold up the concrete slabs and you pull them away from the corners, it creates the perception of slabs that are floating. And this is one of the things that has been so charming uh, about this building is that it almost seems to levitate. Well, these two very different kinds of influences you see everywhere in the Pacific Science Center building. It is a kind of Venetian Gothic and has the uh, arches and the uh, uh, gentle uh, pillars 
and the roofline tiara that one recalls from the Doge's palace. And like Venice, it's filled with water. As a matter of fact, oh, one wag in the office when they were designing this building uh, put a little gondola down in one of the ponds there. Uh, it has that Venetian feel to it very deliberately. And, uh, uh, and then includes these uh, walkways and plantings and fountains that freeze like ice sculptures in the winter. And the Miesian elements. So the platforms that float uh, either on the water or in the air are uh, pulled back. The columns are pulled back from the corners to create that sense of the levitation that you saw in Farnsworth House. The supports for the staircases are built into them so that they, they seem to rise by their own internal force. And of course, the arches at the Science Center, Yamasaki tried to get them as thin as possible. So they have a historical reference to Gothic and Romanesque arches. But now they're done in concrete that can make them more refined and graceful and incredibly light. At the fair, there were a number of celebrity visitors. Among them was this man. Uh, so now I'm going to give you a, a bit of trivia that doesn't go in my book because it's, it, it, it's a side note. But uh, this man came to the fair. His, he was the Shah of Iran. And he had a special reason to be at the fair because he had just commissioned Yamasaki to do the master plan of a very ambitious university that he was building in Shiraz. And uh, you know, it was a, a big deal because he named it after himself, Pahlavi University. And if you look at the models and drawings that Yamasaki's office designed for this, you can see that it is, would be a very uh, much a, a sister building to the Pacific Science Center, done in much the same style with many of the same ideas for colonnades, arches, uh, grand staircases, pools, platforms, open plaza, all of these things that uh, are true of the Pacific Science Center. Although the arches now are not Venetian Gothic, but they are the Islamic Ogival arches. And at the center, uh, an Islamic version of the uh, central arches that we know from the, the science center. So if this had been built, it would have been, uh, I think one of Yamasaki's most important designs and one of his strongest connections to uh, the Seattle would be this building, but it was not built. The master plan is not necessarily a plan for how things are going to actually look, but the a university that was actually built now called Shiraz University is something so different from what Yamasaki designed. It would be something that Yamasaki would would detest. Uh, he didn't like brutalism. But another person who was came to the fair was the man by the name of Guy Tizzoli, who was involved in the uh, Port Authority's uh, plans for the World Trade Center in New York City. And when he saw the Science Center, he was just utterly captivated, enchanted by this marvelous space with these delicate forms uh, that uh, really transported you. Uh, and he thought uh, and convinced others that this would be exactly the kind of style that would balance and soften and humanize the enormous project that they were planning for Lower Manhattan. In his design for the World Trade Center, Yamasaki really did try to achieve some of those qualities that he had achieved in Seattle uh, to make the plaza. He wasn't a big fan of the idea of the world's tallest buildings, but he had the hope that by sending the buildings into the air, you could create 
uh, a plaza that would be a public amenity, some place for a relief from the density and uh, busyness of the Manhattan streets. The plaza was never considered the kind of success that the Pacific Science Center had been, but uh, Yamasaki had those intentions. It's what, what he, something he was trying to carry through in that case. So third, let's talk about the University of Washington Architectural Commission. In special collections at the University of Washington, I found not only minutes from the meetings, but some transcripts that were done there. Uh, if you look on the roster, uh, it included um, Dean Herman, who was the, the first dean of the School of Architecture at UW, William Worcester, who came was a dean in uh, UC Berkeley, uh, it, uh, Paul Theory, famous local architect, Lawrence Halperin, another one, uh, Charles Odegaard, the president of the university, and that same Harold Scheffelman, who had invited Yamasaki to work on the World's Fair. So you can see there's some overlap here. Scheffelman uh, is really recruiting Yamasaki, no doubt, for a similar role at the University of Washington to try to create design standards for the university. At the time the commission was formed, uh, the university had completed uh, Terry and Lander halls, uh, the residence halls, uh, and uh, they were done in this uh, kind of uh, brutalist uh, style, concrete slab style. And uh, Yamasaki, uh, one of the first opinions he aired was that he didn't like those buildings. He didn't like that kind of architecture for a university. There was a man who was in charge of it, uh, Steve Richardson, who was had been commissioned to do another residence hall, McCarty Hall, women's dormitory. And uh, Yamasaki was, was very unhappy with this. And he thought uh, the that the commission should, that the university should just fire him. And uh, in the transcript, you see him voicing these opinions. I can't help it. I have seen the buildings of these men, both in Seattle and on campus. They do the most brutal work. In a university, you should get sensitive, delicate, lovely work. These men have an iron hand. Uh, so uh, he was uh, campaigning to get uh, Richardson kicked off the job. And meanwhile, Richardson was trying to make a building that Yamasaki would like. And so uh, in his design for McCarty Hall, you can see it's a much softer building and done with this warm brick and with these thin columns that have the little pinnacles at the top. It's practically a new formalist building. So this was a pattern that, uh, uh, a pattern that recurred with other architects that they were trying to please uh, both William Worcester and uh, Yamasaki. They were the, the out-of-towners who had a lot of sway. And so you had a series of buildings at the University of Washington that were done in the new formalist style with uh, the thin columns, uh, the narrow windows, the decorative uh, aggregate concrete. Uh, so this is one uh, Mackenzie Hall which is no longer standing, uh, or we could look at um, Sieg Hall, which is a building that includes uh, the narrow columns, the vertical thrust, the aggregate decorative elements. It even has Yamasaki-like hexagonal windows, and then a very prominent tiara along the top. This is a new formalist building uh, and uh, it's an unloved building and one that's in disrepair. So uh, it may join the other buildings that have been demolished. But there were several of these new formalist buildings on campus and they all show uh, a certain amount of Yamasaki's influence. 
Well, if we look back at that transcript, well, the, notice that the subject was Suzalo Library. The library was being uh, given an addition uh, by the architects Binden and Wright. And again, here's another point where Yamasaki piped up. Uh, he was frustrated with the, the design. I can't tell just from the transcript exactly what all the issues were, but here's a quote. He says, he's saying to the architects, you need a more imaginative solution, more glass. The sun might be a problem on the south. If you could protect your glass to a degree, I think it would be wonderful to have glass in those reading rooms. You don't want the library to look like the business administration building. Maybe you should do the whole facade over. Well, there I've said it, right? He really wanted some drastic changes. That was very frustrating to the architects. They didn't know exactly how to please this commission. And finally, what they did was that some of the designers from the architect's office went back to Detroit to work with Yamasaki's designers. And so the facade on this addition reflects more strongly perhaps than almost any other building at the University of Washington, the uh, new formalist qualities, Gothic arches at the base uh, and a, a columns, thin columns rising, and then a tiara that's modeled after uh, designs, Gothic designs in the windows of the old building. So when I started my researches, uh, having been a student at University of Washington, you know, I was wondering, why does that building look so much like a Yamasaki building? And eventually I got my answer. Oh, well, it was a direct influence on that building, very direct. So let's talk about the influence of new formalism as an architectural style. Uh, there are some buildings that are very explicit homages to Yamasaki. Remember, I talked about a building in Minneapolis that has uh, these floor to roof, uh, thin columns that flare at the top and Gothic windows all along the sides. Well, it, there's a building in California, a picture I came across of uh, the Taj Mahal Medical Center which employs uh, almost identical columns and achieves a very similar effect. You know, you might think that was a Yamasaki building. Or Robertson Hall at Princeton, which I talked about with its protruding upper floor and flared columns. I've noticed that in a uh, credit union building in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. So, uh, very explicit references to Yamasaki. The Oberlin building that I talked about with the hexagonal windows, the pattern of repeated hexagonal windows, I came across an homage to that in Everett, Washington, the Snohomish County Courthouse Annex by Harmon, Prey, and Dietrich, the same people who built Sieg Hall at the University of Washington, uh, imitates quite directly uh, Yamasaki's uh, design and building technique uh, with the hexagonal windows in repeated patterns uh, reaching a tiara along the window. So new formalism, you can find it in many places, sometimes with very explicit references to Yamasaki, uh, but it, it crops up in all kinds of bread and butter architecture around town. I went to get the COVID test at Kaiser Permanente on uh, Capitol Hill and lo and behold, oh, there's a Yamasaki building, not by Yamasaki, but a building that has hexagonal windows like this, a white building with a roof line tiara. And when I drive around my neighborhood, I don't know who designed these buildings, but they strike me. They're new formalist buildings. For example, a, a bank building that has a, uh, uh, brick modernized Romanesque arches or an apartment building that has Romanesque styling in thin modernized form all the way around the facade. So new formalism uh, 
as a style is much more prevalent than people realize. And for that reason, Yamasaki's influence, not only on Seattle, but on cities all over the country, is much more extensive than people realize. So now let's turn our attention to the Metropolitan Tract buildings. Um, when Yamasaki left the Architectural Commission, his colleagues wanted to honor him by giving him a building to design on the University of Washington campus. And they decided to have him build the law school. And it was announced in the papers and everything. But, uh, well, uh, they got into a bit of a conflict about the location of the building. The location was planned to be, you know, a couple blocks off campus. And Yamasaki thought the law school should be absolutely central, and particularly if he designed it, right? So uh, they had a conflict and he quit. So he did not design the law school. Instead, we got Condon Hall, which once again is a kind of building that uh, Yamasaki would uh, consider crude and utterly in inappropriate for a university. But he did get to design buildings that were on the property that the university owned. It's called the Metropolitan Tract. And for that project, it was still connected with the university. It was the Board of Regents who uh, were overseeing the project and with whom he had to deal. In this building, he was working with a uh, brilliant engineer, structural engineer by the name of uh, uh, Skilling, John Skilling. And uh, he, uh, he was trying at the time, Yamasaki was criticized for being too decorative in his designs and hiding the structure of the building. So he was kind of responding by bringing structure out to the surface and also incorporating the design elements, the decorative elements into the structure. So in this building, you have thin pinstripe columns that aren't just decorations, they're actually helping to hold up the exterior of the building. They hold up that exterior wall. And then they come down to these huge, super strong marble clad uh, Roman arches that are also helping to hold up the facade of the building. So uh, uh, they're not just decorations, they're, you're looking at structure. Uh, and then uh, he designed a plaza that's below level there. And it was an early effort to try to get uh, some sort of mixed use in an office building. So that idea, that structural idea of the exterior supporting uh, the building was then carried to a much greater degree in the World Trade Center, where the external steel panels and columns are not just holding up the outside facade, they're actually helping to hold up the building. And because of their structural role, the, the interior was allowed to have fewer columns uh, and uh, to soar into the air in a way that was uh, a tube form, the structural engineering that held it up. And this again was skilling, uh, being ingenious. And since the structural engineering came from Seattle, well, why not have the panels themselves come from Seattle? The exterior steel for the uh, Twin Towers was made in Seattle by uh, PACAR, or, uh, Pacific Car and Foundry, which became PACAR. And it was shipped across the country and then threaded through the streets of Manhattan to the building site. The Twin Towers uh, are sometimes called a, a minimalist structure. They, are, they have decorative elements on their exterior, but really their statement is a sculptural statement. Uh, the twinning of these two unusually tall and narrow buildings. And that structural statement, the whole building as a kind of sculpture, uh, is certainly true as well of the Rainier Tower in Seattle. 
uh, a building that uh, uh, Skilling participated in. They, they, he and Yamasaki had a debate about whose idea it was to put this up on the on this concrete perch uh, like that. But it makes it makes the office building a kind of modern sculpture and makes the kind of statement that modern sculpture makes, while at the same time doing that thing that Yamasaki loved of opening up the ground level uh, for urban uses. Now, the urban uses were uh, not as park-like as Yamasaki originally imagined and were occupied by uh, a, 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 a mall. Well, uh, at the time, uh, there was a building, the White Henry Stewart building, uh, which would have to be demolished to build the Rainier Tower and Plaza. It was a building that was uh, very similar to the surviving Cobb building across the street. Well, this was a period when the preservation movement in Seattle was in full force and uh, a, a protest was mounted against the destruction of the White Henry Stewart building. Uh, a flyer that I found for the campaign called it a violation of Seattle's remaining charm uh, and called the White Henry Stewart building one of the city's last showpieces. And then they went after Yamasaki's design. It makes a mockery of the humane urban values, particularly when measured against the loss of this fine old building. This uh, committee was headed up by none other than Victor Steinbrook, the great preservationist architect of Seattle. And he described uh, the shopping center as a bleak suburban shopping center presided over by an upside down office obelisk. I got these from a unsent letter to the Seattle Times I found in the archives. The tower's base will protrude upwards like a giant overturned stubby beer bottle. Not a great image. If the proposed tower makes sense, the pyramids and the Eiffel Tower would have been built upside down too. So there is uh, uh, Steinbrook venting his spleen over this new design. Well, Yamasaki responded by writing a letter to the University Board of Regents. They had asked that could he consider uh, redesigning the building so that it that could preserve the White Henry Stewart building. But he wrote the Regents and said, the White Henry Stewart building and the Olympic block, including the Skinner building, do not enhance in any way the experience which should be fundamental to man during the time he spends in the city. And by contrast, he said that the space provided at the corner of University and Fifth Avenue by the tower structure will be a complete and delightful surprise as you walk along the street. So uh, he dug in his heels, but meanwhile, the national press had taken it up. Wolf von Eckhart in the Washington Post wrote, the tower, the tower's freeform perch, veneered in beige marble and graciously curved outward, is like outdated Detroit automobile styling. They went after the design. And Ada Louise Huxtable, who had been very important to Yamasaki's career early on, was, uh, was quite vicious. The design, she said, is strictly deadpan dreadful, gimmicks masquerading as braces. This, the name of this discredited architectural game is scaleless, scalelessness, discontinuity, inhumanity, and crimes against urban nature. I mean, it starts to sound like crimes against humanity. Well, Yamasaki was moved to respond to Huxtable. And there was this curious phenomenon that what she was saying sounded very familiar. He said, I would like to say that it sounds exactly like it was taken from remarks made by a former classmate of mine from the University of Washington. About 10 or 15 years ago, he was in Seattle without any work and feeling sorry for him, I offered him a job as a designer in our office. For three years, he contributed nothing of consequence and therefore I had to let him go. He has been a vitriolic and outspoken enemy of mine ever since. Who he is, who is he talking about? Well, 
evidence points to Victor Steinberg. Steinberg had indeed worked in his office in Detroit in the late 1950s. And, uh, and so he is suspecting Huxtable as simply taking up uh, Steinberg's language. Well, in the end, uh, Yamasaki won that battle, uh, but uh, the Rainier Tower and all modern buildings, all of Yamasaki's buildings, now are in the opposite situation where there's a question as to whether they should be preserved. Uh, and in fact, uh, this view of the Rainier Tower and IBM building no longer exists because the plaza has been replaced by uh, the new building by NBBJ. So uh, the story continues. Uh, Seattle, a mixed blend of the old and the new and the older new. And it be, makes for a complex architectural history and legacy. Yamasaki brought to the city a unique architectural vision that continues to challenge, to appeal, to captivate a vision that is imaginative and humanistic, but also controversial. And it reminds us that claiming our heritage architecturally is a very mixed thing. But I would hope that in all of our feelings about architecture and the architects that made Seattle what it is, that our feelings would include one of pride. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, I learned a lot. Uh, I feel like there are buildings I am never going to look at the same way. I, I can see in the chat people are clapping. So please imagine a room full of clapping people. Thank and you um, for you in the audience, if you have questions you would like me to ask, please feel free um, to add them to the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, so I'm still, I'm still, curious why why is it that people love his building so much more than the critics is it is it just Victor Steinbrook or what what is that disconnect do you think that you said that that was the thing that really set you off on the journey what what do you think what where does that disconnect come from well that's a very large question and it's something that I spent a lot of time on in the book trying to dig into the assumptions that people bring uh, and I'll just mention a couple. I mean, one of them was that uh, uh, Yamasaki was seen as somebody who was moving backwards. He thought, he thought modern architecture could, could re-adopt historical forms, right? And it would expand the vocabulary of modern architecture. But many architects saw him as moving backwards. You know, modernism was a great revolution in architecture and he was going back in time. And they didn't like that. It's, 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 it's like counter-revolutionary, right? Uh, and uh, they focused a lot on his use of decoration, uh, ornament, which was uh, being uh, removed from buildings. And uh, uh, they, they didn't like, I mean, this is something about all arts, right? If it's popular, it's suspect, right? And so the very popularity uh, became a target. Uh, so for example, accused of being uh, uh, too popular, um, too middle brow. Uh, this word wasn't applied very often, but sometimes kitsch, right? So, uh, those were some of the lines that were taken. I don't think they understand Yamasaki very well, but they have become the standard interpretation. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of like you feel like you can't win. You can't win. No, of course. No, you really can't. <laughs> um, so there's some quest. There's a lot of different questions, but I'm seeing uh, some on Yamasaki itself. This is actually something we were talking about um at the beginning uh before we went live 
which is uh, what was Yamasaki during during World War II during Japanese incarceration? Oh, that's a fascinating story. He uh, he left, of course, uh, in, in, before any of that was happening. He was responding to prejudice here. He went to New York. New York is much more cosmopolitan, more accepting. But of course, when the war happened, uh, there was a lot of prejudice as well in New York. You know, they were all called Japs. And even if they were a loyal Jap, uh, they were suspect. So Yamasaki did some activism at the time back in New York, trying to uh, help out people who had been uh, disrupted by the internment. He got his family to come out and live in his small apartment with his wife uh, uh, to rescue them from internment. And then this remarkable thing happened that he was uh, given the assignment to design and oversee the construction of an entire military base in New York State. It's one of the biggest projects he ever worked on was one that he did during the war uh, as a Japanese American. And uh, it was remarkable that that could happen. There were some incidents with his being uh, a suspect, but uh, he did that. And so uh, it was an example of kind of uh, overcoming uh, uh, some, uh, some of the prejudice. And that's what his whole life was like. Uh, you know, encountering prejudice everywhere for being a Japanese American, uh, and then kind of, uh, you know, accommodating it, you know, brushing it off, saying, yeah, but this is a land of opportunity as well. So going for those opportunities. I think it speaks a lot to the difference between the different sides of the country, too, moving to the outside of that exclusion zone, yeah, yeah. Um, and to be able to continue your career. Right. Um. Oh, wow, lots of different questions. Uh, so there is a question, have we were talking about historic preservation. Uh, did any of Yamasaki's local Seattle work, um, it, is it on the National Register of Historic Places or um, not just Seattle, but of any of his works been nominated for historic preservation? Oh yeah, I don't know the whole story on that. Um, there have been buildings that have been rescued for example, his Century, uh, Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles was uh, slated for demolition to build a higher, higher building. And uh, the, uh, the Los Angeles Conservancy uh, took it on and the uh, local preservationists there uh, in a campaign uh, headed by the uh, the actor Diane Keaton uh, led the campaign to save that hotel, and that was successful. So there have been those. There, there's an effort. There's a building I know of in uh, the Detroit area that the Reynolds Building that uh, is in bad shape, and uh, there is an effort underway to get it historical uh, 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 designation to try to preserve it. So this is, this is ongoing, and uh, I don't know much about specific cases, but I do know that the organization called Documentation and Conservation of the Modern Movement is very interested in preserving Yamasaki's buildings. They have a great nickname, Dokomomo, and uh, the Dokomomo organization has been focused on uh, bringing, drawing national attention to the conservation of modernist buildings. That's great. As you're saying, it's the next wave, right? Of That's right. What's they're getting all, preserved. They're all it's reaching the age. Yeah, they're all reaching the age where it's some, they either have to be preserved or restored or, or, right. or demolished. Right? Uh, another question is, with all the commercial uh, success of Yamasaki's work, what transpired in the design of the pruitt Igo complex? Why did that design not work? Uh, I'm sensing there's a story there. Uh, that, there. There's chapter three of my book in there, <laughs> which uh, was a very long chapter that I had to cut down. Uh, but it, it's uh, it, the Pruitt Igo housing project was a, a, a series, a massive series of large uh, slab high rise 
housing uh, buildings that uh, was going to be a great breakthrough in public housing. And Yamasaki was uh, one of his early designs of going to make a kind of a housing unit that would try to be more innovative, be more livable, and, uh, and it didn't work. It was a disastrous failure. It was one of the greatest failures in the history of public housing. And for many years, people blamed Yamasaki's design. Uh, more recently, there's been a lot of scholarship has gotten prominence, including a documentary called The Pruitt Igo Myth. And the myth is that the design was the key culprit. Uh, and they point to all kinds of different uh, factors that played a role. For example, the financing. There was very little money for maintenance. And in the construction, there were many corners cut. And there were problems with the idea of locating uh, all low income in one area and cutting it off from the rest of the city. These things are pretty obvious to us nowadays that you don't do things like that. But it took some of those disasters like Pruitt Igo to teach us just what a bad idea that is. I feel like it's something we are still learning about. Yeah. So Yamasaki didn't want to be the culprit. He didn't think that design was the only reason. But on the other hand, he didn't want to give up on the idea that good architectural design could be a great public benefit. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to get to read your book. I haven't read it all, the whole thing. And Oh, oh man, this is a great question it's coming in. Um, somebody wanted to know specifically about residential tower work in Hawaii. Oh, yes. Well, I, I have to admit that I did not make it to visit his uh, residential towers in Hawaii. I had asked my dean for money for several trips to support this project. And I, I just couldn't see myself saying to my dean after all that, that I still have important research to do in Honolulu. Uh, but uh, so I didn't make it to those buildings, but yes, there were, he did do high rise buildings, uh, housing buildings indeed in, uh, in uh, Honolulu, the Queen Emma Gardens and uh, a couple of other buildings. And uh, those are not uh, flashy buildings. They are not uh, the most innovative, but they have a lot of his design styling. They are uh, popular buildings. And uh, I recently saw uh, a, a little film that somebody put online analyzing one of them that was showing tremendous appreciation for a lot of the detail work and the thoughtful ways in which things were organized in these buildings. So I thought, well, that's Yamasaki, a very humanist kind of guy, really thinking about users, thinking about how people will experience the buildings. So, uh, so it's still on my list to go, to go visit those buildings. I can see that's probably why people like uh, feel, feel connected to his architecture if he is thinking in, yeah. from it, that human-centered Yeah, he's thinking, how does, how does the user experience this? You know, the the, the, the words that he liked to use to describe his style were serenity, surprise, and delight. Mm. And if you listen to those words, they're all emotions that a user would experience. And that's the perspective that he was always working from. Uh, another question is, did Yamasaki personally know or ever work with Edward Durrell Stone? Uh, yeah, they, well, you know, they certainly knew each other and they knew what each other was doing. And you can see lines of influence uh, of uh, Stone on Yamasaki. So for a while, Yamasaki was doing buildings that had perforated brick or uh, uh, concrete block walls around them. And this is something that was very characteristic of stone. So there was uh, an influence 
uh, by Stone and uh, probably the other direction as well. But at some point, Yamasaki tried to distance himself from Stone. Uh, he, uh, he wanted to say that he was doing something different. And you can see the differences in what the two were doing. Thank you. Oh, a quick question from an earlier comment was, what is the name of the military facility that he designed in New York? Uh, it was uh, the, uh, it was a base at Lake Seneca. Hmm. Great. Uh, I'm not remembering the precise name and it, it's all gone. It no longer exists. Coming back to the local architecture, uh, we had a question from one of our staff members uh, about, is there an architecture tour of the Pacific Science Center or any way to see the inside of the Rainier building? Um, or I'm now blinking on the name of the, the third. Oh, the IBM. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, that I don't know. You know, the Seattle Architecture Foundation are the people who do the architectural tours. And uh, I, I know that they pay attention to Yamasaki's buildings. I don't know about uh, exactly the interior tours. I had a conversation recently with John Magnuson, who is a senior uh, member of the firm that was began as John Skilling's firm. And uh, he worked on the Rainier Tower uh, way back in the 70s. And I'd asked him about the interior. I have not made it to the interior of that building because the pandemic hit just when I was uh, planning to do that. And I asked him about it and he says, it's been remodeled so much that if you go into the interior, you're not gonna see original Yamasaki. So, but on the IBM building, you can walk in uh, the door off of Fifth and there's a staircase there that's really genuine Yamasaki interior design. It has these delicate little handrails and uh, uprights on that. So I go in sometimes and just touch that. Uh, and I have the feeling of, of, of a Yamasaki interior. I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah. All right. I know we're running out of time. So just a couple more questions. Um, one of our viewers was wondering if you could contrast his work with postmodernism. Oh, yes. Um, well, uh, that's chapter 10. Uh, it, uh, I think Yamasaki was a precursor to postmodernism. And indeed, if some of his buildings had build, been built in the 1980s rather than the 60s, you would call them postmodern buildings. Uh, but for some reason, and by the way, you know, another new formalist, Philip Johnson, became one of the leaders of, po of the postmodern movement. But for some reason, a postmodernist wanted to distance themselves from Yamasaki. They wanted to say, we're not doing what he was doing. And one of the founding books of postmodernism, uh, A Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture by Robert Venturi, in its opening pages, it goes out of its way to say what I'm talking about is not Yamasaki. That Yamasaki, he thought, had simple modernist designs that he then decorated. Mm -hmm. and, and what we're talking about is complex designs at their core. Well, I'm not quite convinced by that argument, uh, but, uh, but this is the, the, the story that they told, that uh, he was doing something different. Now, after Yamasaki died, there were people in his office, you know, the, his firm kept going. And one of the things they did was design postmodern buildings. And some of these postmodern buildings are kind of a further elaboration of directions that Yamasaki was taking. So I find that very interesting. Kind of the legacy living on and yeah, expanding right. and yes. growing. Yeah. All right, last question, uh, which is kind of a big one. Uh, it's two parts. 
What do you value most about Yamasaki's life work and what should we always remember? Well, uh, we began by talking about experiences. Um, if you've had an experience of a building uh, that has moved you and has made you think and has symbolized something for you, then there's something valuable in that building. And a building like the Pacific Science Center was one that moved me deeply as a child. I always remember begging my mother for pennies to throw in the fountains because there were so many fountains. It, I felt it must be the luckiest place on earth, right? And the charm of the, of the open spaces and the towers and so forth. So I have childhood memories that move me deeply. Well, when I came back many years later, as a philosopher of architecture who thinks deeply about things, uh, what struck me was this building I had admired has so much going on in it. There's so much of the history of architecture that is echoed and engaged, so much of modernism that's uh, being thought through. Uh, and the attempt, the ambitious attempt to make a modern architecture that would be as symbolically rich as traditional architecture. I found all of this very deep. I mean, Yamasaki gets dismissed as being superficial. Uh, I found all this quite deep, but I must admit that my feelings from my childhood played a role as well. So that's what I appreciate. I appreciate that there's, uh, it's, it's, pleasurable architecture, it's fun architecture, it's playful architecture. But once you get to thinking about it, you can find remarkable depths that are in its architectural form. And then of course, the deep role that it now plays in the story of the United States, not only through the history of his many buildings and uh, disasters like pruitt Igo but of course the World Trade Center and the loss of that building, which means that Yamasaki touches the life of every single American. And so he's tremendously important for that reason. Thank you. You've definitely given me a new perspective on him and some of the buildings that I've spent my whole life walking past. How about that? That's great. Really, really appreciate you. Um, so thank you so much, Paul, for speaking. Thank you so much to our ASL interpreters. Thank you so much for our um, live captioner. We really appreciate having you here. And thank you to you, the audience, for coming. Uh, we couldn't do this without you and for bringing all your wonderful questions. So um, we hope to see you back next month. Um, we're going to be doing History Cafe, honoring Bainbridge Island's Indipino community which will include a screening of the fairly new documentary on this topic called Honor Thy Mother. Check out our website for more information and to register. Also, we would love if you take just a few moments to fill out a survey, which we will put in the chat to give us a little more information about what you liked, what you would like to see in our programming so that we can constantly bring you the best in regional history. And um, we are now offering uh, a raffle if you uh, are willing to take the survey. So click the link to learn a bit more. And finally, um, a big thank you also to History Link too. I don't want to forget them. And finally, if you learned something new or support the work that we do, please consider making a gift or becoming a member to help us support future programs and sustain the work of the museum. We're so grateful to all of you and to everything you shared. And we look forward to seeing you in person when that is possible, but are appreciative of the Zoom space for now. So thank you all, stay safe and have a lovely evening. Have a good night.